Hi everybody, my name is William Choi and I am delighted to be talking to you all today about my personal journey into medicine as part of Lingo X's summer program. So I graduated from high school in 2018 and then I graduated from Johns Hopkins University studying neuroscience and philosophy last year in 2021. And I just graduated this year with a master's in bioethics at Harvard and I will be going to Brown for medical school this upcoming fall. So outside of my academic interests, I really love um, playing with my cat and watching a lot of movies, a lot of shows, particularly in the sci-fi and horror genre. And if I have time, I really love going hiking. So all that aside, I'm today going to be talking about my career path in medicine and what the general field of medicine entails. And so I'm gonna start off by talking about some of the common reasons that I hear about people wanting to go into medicine that I personally think are not sustainable reasons. And after that, we'll explore some of what I think are good reasons for people to pursue medicine. So the first uh, reason that I hear a lot about is the money uh, and the money that the position kind of draws for you as a career. And first of all, I think that finances are definitely a legitimate consideration for any career option. You know, you want to be financially rewarded for the kind of hard work that you put into. And I think that's a totally valid reason. But oftentimes it can end up being a lot of pre-meds uh, biggest or sometimes even sole reason for pursuing medicine. And those people don't end up um, really making it to medical school because they realize that there are much easier and quicker ways to make money uh, than pursuing the path of medicine. And you'll see throughout the rest of my presentation that the path to becoming a doctor especially is very long, uh, very arduous, but if you're passionate about it, definitely worth it. And so I think while finances are definitely an important consideration, it should definitely not be uh, the only reason because at the end of the day, you will find better career options that are more suited for your needs, uh, your financial needs. The second reason that I hear most often is the prestige aspect, you know, the social status that the position kind of gives to you in, in society. And I think, you know, very similarly, um, as you get to college and beyond, people are just simply too busy living their own lives and thinking about their own careers that, you know, prestige doesn't really matter. And sometimes it can even feel like you're stuck in school, staying behind at school while your friends have, you know, graduated college and now are working real jobs. They're earning in uh, money at a sometimes a greater, greater quantity than you are, um, especially during your residency years. And so I think, you know, life is a long game. Um, you know, your career as a physician can be really long and drawn out. And so it's definitely worth considering if that prestige aspect is definitely worth um, that. And the third reason that I hear often is the parental pressure, of course. And especially, you know, I think with Asian parents, but with a lot of parents in general, um, obviously they want what is best for us and they direct us towards these stable careers in medicine or law. But at the end of the day, this is your life and no one can live it for you, not even your parents. And so it's worth considering whether you find passion in the fields that you are kind of being nudged towards and really finding um, that these career decisions are something that you care about. Because at the end of the day, these are decisions that will affect you and your happiness in life. So I think while there definitely exists parental pressure, um, it's also important that you find personal passion um, and interest in the field. Okay, so what does uh, constitute good reasons or what I think are sustainable reasons to uh, go into medicine? What are some of the qualities in uh, people who might find medicine to be a good fit for them? So the first quality I think is compassion. Uh, being a physician means that you're working directly with patients, oftentimes who are very much in pain and really caring for them, treating for them, listening to their concerns and responding to them. So if you feel like you're someone who uh, finds compassion and empathy to be really important parts of your future career options, I definitely think that medicine can fit into one of those categories. Of course, there are definitely other ways to help people um, and be compassionate towards other people. So let's explore the second reason, which is curiosity. So medicine is a very rapidly evolving field 
And you know, a lot of the scientific disciplines that are associated with medicine is also very rapidly evolving. There are tons of new literature and new research studies that are coming out every year, um, updating medical professionals about you know what is the latest prescription or what is the latest drug or what is the latest surgical technique. And you know, we want our doctors to not prescribe us with outdated prescriptions, to not perform surgeries with outdated techniques, right? We want them to be at the forefront, at the cutting edge of science and technology and medicine. And so it's very important that even after school, that doctors are always naturally curious about ways to improve upon their care, to read up on the latest literature, to practice new techniques, right? And so if you are someone who is naturally curious, and you know, not even necessarily in scientific disciplines, but just in general about the world and learning new things and improving uh, upon things, um, this might be the field for you. And thirdly, but not lastly, is communication. Communication is very, very important, in my opinion, to be a good physician. You can be a compassionate person, a curious person, but at the end of the day, you are a doctor, and a doctor needs to interact and communicate with their patients effectively. And it doesn't matter if you're a you know, family physician and you're seeing you know, the same family for you know, several years, decades, or you're just a surgeon who sees a patient once before, during, and after surgery and never see them again. A doctor always has to interact and talk with their patient or their families, right? And so in order to be a good physician, you really need to learn um, and enjoy talking with people and learning how to navigate sometimes really difficult uh, conversations and decisions uh, with poise. And I think that if you are someone who enjoys talking with people and really values that communication aspect as part of your future career option, then medicine is definitely a path for you as well. Okay, so now I wanted to go over a quick overview of the pre-health pathway um, in terms of the schooling, right? So this is coming from the perspective of an American. So in the United States, after four years of high school, you have to go through four years of typically college. And after that, you go through four years of medical school. After that, you go through around three to seven years of residency. And this is optional. Um, you can do a one to three years of fellowship training. And this is just a deeper dive into um, your specialty, your area of expertise. And I'll be going over in more detail what each of these steps entail. But overall, you're looking at around 12 to 18 years of academic training. And um, this is after high school, of course. And so in addition to the uh, schooling, there's a lot of um, standardized tests you have to take. So after the SATs and ACTs in high school, you have to take what's known as the MCAT in medical school. And in um, medical school, you'll have to take step one, step two exams, which qualify you for residencies. And yet after that, you have to take board exams, so on and so forth. And so um, standardized tests will always sort of be a part of your uh, training, at least in the initial stages of becoming a doctor. So uh, just make sure to keep that in mind. And you know, if you're someone who doesn't mind that aspect, who is, you know, no one really enjoys standardized testing, of course, but if you're someone who is okay with that, um, then again, that's good because that won't really be a barrier for you in the training. Okay, so let's break it down a little bit more in detail. So the first stage of high school, um, you know, this, some of the advice that I might give may seem very obvious, but you know, do well in school, get good grades, get you know, good test scores, pursue good extracurriculars, club leadership positions, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure stuff that you've all already sort of heard of. And I think this is important not only to get into the college of your choice, but also to develop the sort of skills, the study habits, the leadership skills um, that you will end up using in college and beyond. I think high school is a really important time for you to experiment, to learn new things and decide for yourself what you like and what you don't like. Are there some subjects that you're naturally drawn towards? Are there some that you, know, you could never imagine yourself doing again? Uh, what's, what are you open to? What, what is really interesting for you? What is really inspiring for you? I think, um, especially in the United States at least, a lot of the colleges will actually ask you, you know, what is your favorite movie? What is your favorite book? Um, what is some news media that you like to read? They really want to make sure that outside of these, uh, outside of the homework, uh, what are you really interested in? What are you really passionate about? And I, I think high school is a great time for um, you know, young minds to really discover what they like and what they don't like. 
I also want to make a quick note that, you know, getting good test scores and grades is obviously very important um, for college applications, but getting into a prestigious college doesn't necessarily mean that you will also get into a good medical school or get into medical school at all. And vice versa, if you don't get into um, a well-known school, for example, um, that doesn't mean you can't get into a great medical school. I know plenty of people and plenty of examples where you know people who go to really top-tier colleges you know, don't end up with a successful medical school cycle. And on the other hand, people who go to, you know, their local state university, for example, get into like really great top tier medical schools. Um, so obviously I think there are advantages to going to a competitive college. Um, you get to connect with people um, who are doing great research. You're surrounded by peers who are academically competitive. So that will drive you academically as well. Um, but at the end of the day, going to a great college is not necessarily a golden ticket to medical school or a good medical school. Um, so I think that's just important to keep in mind. Okay, so after high school, you apply to college and you go into college. And once you're in college, you'll have to choose a major. And typically in the United States, you choose a major after your freshman year. Um, obviously you can do it earlier if you already kind of know what you wanna study. And so some of the common questions that I get about majors is, first of all, is there a pre-med major? And if not, do I have to major in biology in order to be a pre-med? And also, what happens if I'm not interested in majoring in the sciences? Do I have to major in the sciences? And these are all perfectly great and legitimate questions. So firstly, there is no such thing as a pre-med major. Pre-med is actually a track that uh, people go through. It's sort of a label that students kind of put on themselves to show like, hey, you know, I'm studying to go to medical school. And so what happens is that medical schools will have a set of requirements, pre-medical requirements for their applicants to fill out in order to get into medical school. And this is typically like, you know, a year of biology, a year or two of chemistry, a year of physics, things like that. Um, some of these could be fulfilled by your AP credits, um, but it also depends on whether your college accepts AP credits. Um, but that aside, ultimately there's no such thing as a pre-med major. Um, a lot of people tend to major in biology because the requirements to fulfill that major overlap considerably with the requirements um, for medical schools. But it's totally possible to pursue and major something um, non-biology or non-science even, and also fill out those pre-medical requirements on the side as well. It's definitely doable. I personally think that someone who chooses to major in the humanities, for example, like history, English, philosophy, literature, um, are actually able to make themselves more unique in the applicant pool. Because if you think about it, a lot of the admissions officers who are reading these medical school applications, they see a ton of students who major in the sciences or in biology. And so when they see someone who comes from a different a background or has a different major like the humanities that is more interesting to them, right? So I think that doesn't mean that you shouldn't major in biology. I think there are pros and cons. Um, and the at the end of the day, I don't think there's any particular benefit in choosing whatever major um, that you think will help you get into medical school. I think everyone should definitely major and pursue in what they are interested in. And that helps them talk passionately about their major uh, when it comes to interview seasons, for example, or when they have to write their essays about why they decided to you know, choose to study X, Y, Z. So yeah, most importantly, I think you should be passionate about these majors. Um, I personally studied neuroscience and philosophy because I was general, genuinely interested in them and not because I thought they would necessarily help me get into a better medical school. And I am you know, really glad I still am interested in those fields and I'm hoping to carry them into medical school. One thing to note is that um, in terms of the pre-medical requirements, um, a lot of medical schools have actually transitioned away from the strict course requirements they used to have. So before it used to be like a certain number of credits for biology, for chemistry, blah, blah, blah. Um, now they've transitioned away to have more flexible requirements, but they still do exist. Okay, so now we're getting into medical school and beyond. So at this point, I don't have as much expertise here because I'm not in medical school right now, and also um, I'm not a doctor, obviously. But here's a general overview of what you can expect um, once you get through high school, once you get to college, now you're in medical school, congratulations. 
what happens now. So in medical school, you actually get to start your training as a future physician. So you get to apply your knowledge from the classroom to the real world. You get to interact with real patients under the mentorship of, uh, of doctors, of course. And you start learning also about different specialties um, because now you have to decide what sort of residency you wanna to apply to. So really quickly, what is a residency? So residency is basically like a college major except in the field of medicine. And you know, being a doctor doesn't mean you get to practice everything. Um, although I guess internal medicine doctors, they do practice uh, broadly. But in general, doctors usually um, specialize or are experts in a very particular area of the human body. So you know, there are, I think, over a hundred specialties in the United States alone. Um, you could be a neurologist, uh, an anesthesiologist, an orthopedic surgeon, um, a ophthalmologist. There are just, you know, so many different areas of the human body that people can specialize in. And medical school is the time where people really start to identify what parts of the body that they're interested in studying, um, for example, the brain, and uh, really get to see what clinical practice is like in the real world. And after you apply to residency and you get into residency, you can also then choose to pursue a fellowship after that. And so fellowships um, are another deeper layer of studying um, in the field of your choice. And so typically, you know, if you want to subspecialize or if you want to you know, learn more, do more research in a particular field that you're really passionate about, you'll apply to fellowship and spend a few more years doing training, um, maybe learning more skills. And um, obviously after that is just full-time work. And uh, in terms of full-time work, there's also a variety of options. You could work in a university hospital, which is much more academic. You know, you're probably working uh, with you know, students to some capacity as well. You can also work with um, or work in a community hospital um, in you know, your local community. You can start your own private practice. Um, that gives you more flexibility. You can earn more money potentially, but you'll also have to handle some of the administration stuff, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so before I sort of wrap up this section of my lecture, I wanted to quickly touch upon grad school um, because I did do a master's program, I had to apply for it. Um, and so yeah, I just wanted to really quickly talk about um, grad school and gap years. So it's becoming increasingly popular for uh, pre-med students to take a gap year, at least one gap year after college and before medical school. And they take this time to really uh, build upon their experiences, to beef up their resume, so that they can become a more competitive applicant uh, for medical schools. Now, this doesn't mean that you should take gap years, but it definitely means that it can help. And if you feel like you need to take some more time after college to really learn about whether or not this is something that you're truly passionate about, um, that's totally fine. Not everyone figures that out after college. And it's definitely important that you explore um, that field or other fields or other careers before you make a really firm decision because medical school and beyond is a really big commitment. So you need to make sure that this is something that you really want to do for the rest of your life. Um, so I personally chose to pursue a master's degree in bioethics. I think there are a lot of ethical issues that are made in the clinic. Um, so, you know, if you're someone who is interested in that aspect of medicine as well, um, I think there's space for you in medicine as well. Um, you know, this recent COVID pandemic, I think, brought to light a lot of ethical issues. We could talk about, you know, ventilator or vaccine allocation. We could talk about, you know, access to healthcare for minority populations in the United States. Um, we could talk about, you know, the rise in violence against Asians. Uh, in the United States due to uh, stigmatization uh, associated with COVID. A lot of really um, deep moral problems that I think physicians have a lot of responsibility um, to, to kind of tackle. So I think um, these are important, I think, education and not just bioethics, but you know, others master, other master's programs like medical education, um, clinical sciences, other fields are, are equally important. Um, and if that's something you choose to do in your gap year, that's great. I also know people who uh, work in a hospital as a clinical scribe, or they just do more clinical research. I think that's also very important, very valuable work. And so, yeah, it just all depends on what you want to do during that extra few years or a year. All right, so before I get into the Q&A session, I really uh, wanted to talk about the fact that all this information might seem really overwhelming to some of you. And 
you know, some of you might actually get turned off or scared um, from this pathway. Hopefully not, but I understand that it can definitely feel uh, like a lot and a very overwhelming. Um, and I'm here to say that, you know, I'm not here to um, mince my words and I will be pretty honest about the fact that this pathway um, is difficult and it is very arduous. Um, but at the same time, it can be very rewarding and very fun. And especially if you have a passion, genuine passion for the field, then, you know, a lot of this work will be worth it. And so I think personally, you know, getting to treat someone um, and just caring for someone who is at their lowest moment of their lives is just an incredible honor to have and an incredible privilege to have. And if that is something that gives you meaning in your career or gives you meaning even in life, I think that medicine um, might be the right, right path for you, given all these considerations. Um, at the same time, you can feel like being a physician still seems really difficult, and you're not sure if, you know, you really care about these things, you really care about healthcare, but you're not sure if being a physician is the right fit. Well, there are definitely a ton of other uh, healthcare related career options for you. You can be, you know, a nurse, physician associate, nurse practitioner, um, you can be a dentist, um, you know, there are a lot of different other fields that are related to healthcare that will let you work on um, these issues without necessarily having to go through that really grueling uh, training and long training process. And so I unfortunately don't have as much authority on how to go about these specific alternate pathways, um, but I'm here to tell you that, um, you know, these career pathways are definitely worth serious consideration and being a doctor isn't the only way that you can treat people or care for people. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some um, questions that I received. And so I think um, we're just gonna jump right into it. So the first question is, why did you choose your major and pathway? So I was interested in neuroscience after taking a course at my local university, UCI, on the drugs and the brain. Um, it was sort of random. I was sort of, you know, initially just interested in the brain. And I think the course was, you know, really captivating for me. And I continued that interest in a summer program run by Hopkins, where you just get to take um, undergraduate level courses. I took this introduction to neuroscience by a pretty well-known professor at the time. And I was hooked. I, I really loved um, neuroscience. And so it was an obvious thing for me to major in it when I got into Hopkins. And uh, philosophy, um, I took a philosophy of mind course when I was a freshman, sort of on a whim. And honestly, it was a really, really big influence over my decision to major in philosophy because the questions that were being asked were, you know, really interesting, really profound, really thoughtful. And I am personally really glad that I majored in philosophy um, because I think it really sharpened my critical thinking skills and um, just made my college experience that much more fun. And, and I absolutely uh, think I would have regretted it if I didn't uh, major in philosophy. In terms of like pre-med and medicine and the medical career pathway in general, um, I think there are just two um, major reasons that I decided to pursue this. So the first one being that I was pretty academically successful at a lot of the disciplines that are required for pre-med students, things like biology, chemistry, physics. And, you know, obviously you don't have to be a super genius in all of them, but you do have to have some baseline competency in those disciplines, right? Um, and the second reason, um, so I think coming to the United States as an immigrant, I personally and my mother experienced some difficulties in accessing good health care um, like we did in Korea because the system here is very different. We also had a language barrier. And I think that at least partly inspired my decision to actually go into the medical community so I could be a physician reaching out to other people who might be coming from overseas or live in these communities that don't necessarily get um, the greatest outreach in, in medical care. And so that's something that I'm passionate about and something that I kind of want to develop um, and sort of pursued uh, medicine for. All right, second question. What are your favorite and least favorite parts of your major or pathway? So I think my favorite part about medicine and the field of neuroscience to an extent is that it is always changing. It's really exciting, fast paced stuff and it's ever evolving. And the brain I think is one of the last um, sort of mysteries of the human body. We don't really understand what's going up here, um, even now, and we don't have a lot of cures for neurological disorders. And so I think that creates a lot of potential for us to improve and to investigate the brain and, you know, 
create good medical practice out of it. And so I think that's something that just really excites me. And I think with philosophy and uh, bioethics, um, it's really taught me to think more deeply and more self-reflectively about you know, the kind of decisions that I get to make as a potential future physician and how that affects people around me. And I think just in general, like I said before, philosophy and ethics really helps me connect with people more on a human level and really try to understand other people's perspectives and try to think about things in a creative and different way. And so I think if you're someone who, um, you know, really likes exercising that right part of your brain, um, it's, it's definitely an important skill to have in, in medicine. Some of my least favorite parts um, about medicine, I think is that sometimes it can feel a bit limiting in terms of what you can do as a physician. Uh, oftentimes you're only seeing uh, patients within the clinic, right? So they're coming to you with a problem already and your job is to solve that problem uh, through treatments or surgeries or whatever interventions. Um, and sometimes that can feel a little bit limiting when the patients are going back into an environment that you know, systematically impedes their health, whether it's, you know, lack of insurance, that means they can't access certain treatment options, or if it's a unhealthy, toxic environment that physically damages their health, um, it feels like you can't do much about that as a physician. But the good thing I think is that uh, as a physician, you're not just limited to clinical care or clinical practice. You can also incorporate political advocacy or healthcare advocacy into your uh, work um, in conjunction with your medical care. So I think um, if this is something that is uh, a passion for you, then it's something that you can definitely do as a doctor. And in terms of philosophy, really quickly, I think my least favorite part is just the readings can sometimes be long, dry, boring, um, inaccessible. I think um, sometimes it can be a little bit too abstract sometimes, and I think bioethics really helps connect philosophy and all that theory with the real world. And it really forces us to learn and think about how we can apply theory in real life. And I think that's the same for medicine, you know? I think it's exciting that the things that I can learn in the classroom, I can now directly apply in the real world and affect real change. I'm just gonna sip some water. All right, third question. <clears throat> what does my workload look like? So I'm assuming this is talking about college. Um, so in college, honestly, it was not that bad for me. I think I only pulled one all-nighter in all three years of college. And for the most part, I got like seven to eight hours of sleep average. So I think it's all about good time management, honestly. As long as you're allocating your time properly and you're developing good study habits, you will have the ability to make time for friends. You will have time for fun. You know, I think college, yes, you're, go you're going there to study hard for your careers, but it's also a time for you to have fun. And I think that's important to have that balance. All right, question four. How did you make a college list? How many colleges did you apply to? So I applied early decision to Hopkins. So I technically only applied to one college because I had to withdraw my other applications after I got that acceptance. Um, but I think my general advice for creating a college list is to, you know, really look into the programs um, and, you know, you could just do that over the internet, go on their websites and, you know, see what about each program or each college that you like. For example, I chose Hopkins because Hopkins has a very reputable neuroscience program. And so, yeah, go on the website, maybe look at their mission statement to see, you know, if any of that resonates with your own values, maybe look around in, you know, the Department of Biology or Neuroscience or whatever you're interested in, see what kind of research they're doing, see if you're interested in that. And if you can, I would try to talk to current students who are actually attending or have attended those universities to sort of get an insider's perspective on what those colleges are actually like, their strengths and weaknesses, things like that. All right, number five. Do you have any tips on essay writing for personal statements and supplemental essays respectively? So I think the advice that I would give to both essays actually is uh, the importance of structure. So uh, in my time, I've read over quite a number of college application essays and also some medical, uh, medical school application essays. And I think a common mistake that I find in both of them is that some people will just sort of write um, their thoughts down, and they end up writing somewhat of a disorganized jumble of words and stories. And they don't necessarily answer the prompt or the question sometimes. 
and that can be um, really detrimental to how your application be, will be perceived by the reader because the reader isn't like a super literary genius, right? Like they need a very easy to read essay that can also you know, somewhat inspire them with the confidence that this person um, you know, has answered the question or is really passionate about medicine or whatever, right? So I think in order to do that, you need to make sure that each part of your essay, each paragraph and even each sentence, maybe even each word is very intentionally placed. Um, so that makes writing uh, really like detail oriented and really laborious, but I think it is very important for people to have um, that kind of mental structure in their head. Um, and I think, you know, if you're feeling stuck or if you have writer's block, it's totally fine to just write down like a stream of consciousness, all your ideas, all your stories, like sometimes I think the best answer is just to write, just write, write, write. But I think it's important that you're able to then go back and then pick out the things that you think are important and then organize them. And that organization process I think is key to writing a good application essay. This is different from your usual school essay or your narrative persuasive essay, right? This is an application essay. There are very specific things that people are looking for. So yeah, my advice, always make sure that you have some kind of skeleton structure of the essay so that when you go back, you can fill those, fill the slots in with the content that you want. And um, you can, you know, you can think about your essay in a much more structured way. Like, what do I want here in this intro? What do I want here in the body of the essay? What do I want here in the conclusion that can tie everything here together? Um, and I think following that structure is, is um, already makes essays so much better than they were before. All right, number six, what do you perceive to be the most important part of the college application process? So I actually think that essays can be a pretty underrated part of the process. Now, I don't know if this is because I went to a high school that really emphasized academic achievement above everything else. Um, but I think when it came time to apply for colleges, um, I definitely was surprised by how important the essays were and how much of a difference that good writing can get you far in terms of the application cycle and vice versa, how a poor writing, poor essays can really set you back in the application cycle. So yeah, definitely, um, yeah, make sure that you develop good writing skills and don't estimate the power of um, good writing. And, and this is relevant even um, for med school application and I'm sure even after that as well. All right, number seven, what was my GPA and SAT, ACT score? Do you think they played a large part in your application? <clears throat> So in high school, my unweighted GPA was a 4.0, my weighted GPA was a 4.35, and my SAT was a 2370 out of 2400. Um, we used the old scale at the time, and my ACT was a 36. So I do think they played uh, an, somewhat of an important role in my application process. Um, I definitely don't think um, it was the end-all be-all. I mean, I know plenty of people who didn't get a 4.0 in high school, who didn't get you know perfect or near perfect SAT ACT scores, and they still ended up going to like Hopkins with me or to like UC Berkeley or UCLA and really great colleges, right? Um, so yeah, I think you know you should definitely strive to do the best as you can academically, and you know after all, medicine is a pretty academic field, um, but also make sure to understand that grades and scores aren't everything. It's not the end of the world if you don't get those extremely high scores. And you can definitely you know, make up for that by doing really awesome extracurriculars um, and writing really good essays. I think, I think that's uh, yeah, underrated part of the application process. So what hobbies and extracurriculars did I focus on during high school? So my two main extracurriculars in high school were speech and debate and chorus. And I pretty much just stuck and invested all my time in these two activities through all four years of high school. And I think it paid off in the end. Um, I had a really successful career, I think, in speech and debate and in chorus as well. And I got to write about them in my college application essays as well. I do think that, you know, looking back, I wish I'd explored a little bit more extracurriculars. I think I was just really limited by only focusing on two. Um, and I didn't really understand the importance of extracurriculars at the time. So um, yeah, I think my extracurriculars were sort of my biggest weakness in the application cycle. But, you know, I turned out fine. It's not the end of the world. Um, if this, this is the advice that I can give to you, um, younger folks is, you know, don't make the same mistake that I did. Um, but even if you feel like 
you're sort of lacking in extracurriculars, it's not the end of the world. All right, what study tips do you have for students to do well in school? So I think it's important to really try different studying strategies. So, and I suspect that a lot of people will do this, but you know, what I used to do and still sort of do in terms of note taking is basically read like the textbook with the lecture notes and then just summarize them on a separate piece of paper. And I'll use like my highlighters and you know, blah, blah, blah. And then like, once I have the notes down, I'll like review them and like read them over again. Um, I think it works to a certain extent, but you know, a lot of studies have shown that that's not like the best way to retain information, um, especially long term. So, you know, if that's what you're doing right now, that's fine. I do think that it's important to be flexible and willing to change your studying habits depending on the subject or, you know, just depending on how you learn as a person. Um, and there's, a, you know, a ton of different techniques that you can find out there that are probably more efficient than that, like lecture, copy, paste, summarize um, strategy that I talked about. You know, you can make flashcards, um, space repetition techniques, Pomodoro techniques, um, you know, try studying alone versus studying with other people. You know, one of the best ways that I learn is to um, sit down with a friend and just bounce, you know, make up test questions and then ask each other that. And that really helps me memorize. Um, so yeah, whatever works for you, but I think it's definitely important to explore different studying strategies. All right, number 10, if you ever did research or worked an internship, how did you come across this opportunity? So yeah, I've been involved in several labs throughout college and in grad school. And the way I did this is basically, you know, once I got into college, for example, um, I went on the Hopkins website and I went to their department of neuroscience because I was really interested in neuroscience. And so when you go on the department of neuroscience, and this is similar to other colleges, I think too, but you'll find a list of professors and you'll see that each professor has a little biography and it will typically have their research projects or their research interests listed or described. And so I read through them, you know, I thought, you know, oh, this seems interesting. And I made a short list of professors whose research that I found pretty interesting. And then after that, I would just cold email them. Um, I would send them an email like, hey, um, and by the way, you can find their contact on that profile, but I'll say something like, you know, hello, um, Miss Dr. Blah, blah, blah. I am a student at Hopkins. I, I'm studying neuroscience. I got really interested in your research, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think I have the time here to really go into detail about, you know, a template of um, uh, cold emailing, but if you're interested, definitely feel free to reach out to me and I'm sure we can arrange something. So yeah, basically um, I would cold email these professors. Um, I think it's important to know also that some of the research that, or the labs that you start working in um, initially won't always turn out to be, you know, your best experience. Um, for example, I started off in a lab my freshman year um, and I stuck with it all three years, but I don't think I, it was definitely not my calling. Um, it was definitely a good experience because I learned what it's like to work in a basic science lab, which is basically a lot of pipetting, a lot of, you know, cell sample screening, a lot of biochemistry techniques. Um, it was really cool, um, but ultimately I didn't have as much fun um, and it was, um, it was just not for me. So um, after my freshman year, I reached out to a doctor who was doing more clinical based research. And when I started working with her, uh, the work was a lot more exciting. Um, it, it made a lot more sense to me. And so, yeah, I think it's important to realize that, um, you know, it's important to have a diversity of different research experiences and understand what you really like to do. All right, number 11. What are your plans after schooling education, career-wise? I'm heading off to medical school, so hopefully uh, I'll be practicing as a physician. All right, number 12. What is your take on the importance of learning languages, especially global languages like Chinese and English? I think it's very important. Um, in addition to Chinese and English, um, Spanish is very widely spoken here in the United States. And it's a very important skill, especially if you're a doctor who's practicing in the US and you're trying to work with underserved populations. Um, a decent proportion of that population uh, are Hispanic or Spanish speaking. So I personally wish I spent a lot more time learning a different language um, other than Korean and English. Um, 
even in high school, honestly. So I'm, I'm still using apps like Duolingo to learn Spanish, but it's obviously not as good as if I learned them when I was younger. Um, so yeah, our world is getting closer and closer together, I think, as it does in the future, um, and it already is, the importance of knowing different languages will be really important. All right, final question. What do I think about Lingo Access Mission? So on their website, Lingo Access Mission says, that they are ensuring that all students have access to quality, authentic foreign language education, regardless of income level. And I think that's a great mission. And I am really personally proud of Mia, um, who is, I believe, the founder and CEO of the organization for spearheading this super important initiative. And I can only hope that I've contributed some part in meeting her and her team's goals. Um, I, I think this is a, is a great cause. And um, I'm just really happy to be part of it. So uh, with that being said, I would like to thank Lingo X for inviting me, uh, giving me a platform to speak a little bit about my experiences. And um, hopefully you'll be able to contact me. I'll provide some contact information to the team. Um, but otherwise, thanks so much for listening. And uh, yeah, that's it. Bye.